I have a confession to make. I utterly adore the OC. And you may be thinking, really? The OC? The Fox Network relic of American teen drama and dated early aughts fashion? The show that helped pioneer the reality television disasters such as The Hills and The Real Housewives of Orange County? Well, yes. Well, yes! I love this silly little teeny bopper melodrama more than anything. Welcome to the OC, bitch! And so what? If Jim DeRogatis loves California, then you are in no position to judge my nostalgia, okay? Come on, Greg, sing it with me. California! <laughs> the dulcet tones of Jim DeRogatis. Phantom Planet. How are you a... not famous as a singer? I, uh, I love criticism too much. <laughs> And yes, the OC certainly has its flaws. Believe me, I know. It was an all-white cast. Most of the dialogue and character writing has aged like milk. Suck it, queer. She's so retarded sometimes. Who are you? Whoever you want me to be. Okay. And the making of the show was no picnic either, that's for sure. I will not be delving further into that part of things, but if you are more interested in investigating the behind-the-scenes drama, there are an endless stream of articles about it, and there's also a book about the show called Welcome to the OC and Oral History, but that's the TLDR. Despite all these flaws, this show means the world to me because at the core, it's a show about found family. The main protagonist, Ryan Atwood, is introduced to us when he's arrested for stealing and crashing a car in the pilot. Ryan is clearly a troubled teenager who's a victim of circumstance. He grew up working class, his brother is a terrible influence, and his mother regularly abandons him on and off. But Ryan's big turning point and the start of his redemption arc begins when Sandy Cohen, his court-appointed lawyer, sees potential in him. Your test score is 98th percentile in your SAT ones. Right, 98th percentile, if you start going to class, are you thinking about college? <laughs> and after Ryan's mother skips town yet again, seemingly for good this time, Sandy and his wife Kirsten legally adopt Ryan, allowing him to start fresh and experience something he never had, a loving family and a second chance at life. Ryan is obviously the heart of the show, but the tone setter is Seth Cohen, Ryan's dorky comic book loving stepbrother and best friend, who provides all the comic relief of the show with his quick wit and self deprecating humor. You're Cohen now. Welcome to a life of insecurity and paralyzing self doubt. And Seth Cohen is also where the OC's iconic soundtrack, the topic of this video, comes in, because an equally important narrative device in the show as Seth Cohen himself is Seth Cohen's iPod. We got Death Cab, we got Bright Eyes, we got The Shins, we got Cavalier and Clay, and we got Goonies. It's not just for kids, Ryan. It's not. I don't care what they tell you. Seth Cohen is a massive hipster dork. He loves indie rock bands like Death Cab for Cutie, Modest Mouse, The Walkmen, and The Killers, all bands who made appearances on the OC themselves by performing at The Bait Shop. If you're a One Tree Hill fan, The Bait Shop is basically the OC's version of Trick, a fictional nightclub where all the guest star performers made their appearances on the show. The OC's impact on popular culture and indie rock cannot be understated. The show was a massive cultural linchpin of 2000s indie rock, and the show became a launchpad for many artists' careers as well. After the teen pop rock band Rooney appeared on the show in the 15th episode of season one, they saw a 200% increase in record sales. Every third or fourth word out of the cast's mouth happens to be Rooney. Like, hey, you guys going to the Rooney show? No, I can't go to the Rooney show. The Rooney tickets are sold out at the Rooney show. Wow. You know Rooney? Because today will soon be tonight, and tonight will be Rooney. And Rooney will be awesome. Rooney. Rooney. Rooney! And it eventually got to the point where major artists like Beck, U2, and the BC Boys even started using the show to premiere their new releases. Two OC cast members, Rachel Bilson and Melinda Clark, hosted an OC recap podcast for a while called Welcome to the OC Bitches. And one of their guests on the podcast was the OC's music supervisor, Alexandra Patsavas 
who is also responsible for all the banging soundtracks of major network shows and films such as The Twilight Saga, Grey's Anatomy, Gossip Girl, Mad Men, Bridgerton, The Hunger Games, Supernatural, Dynasty, Riverdale, and Perks of Being a Wallflower. On Rachel and Melinda's podcast, Patsavas describes every song choice in the OC as very deliberate and artfully crafted to serve as a crucial narrative device in the story. I think it's the music that Josh liked, the music that Stephanie liked. Um, I think I often got the question over the years, did you use indie music because it was cheaper? <laughs> and mm-hmm. yeah. like, really? And, you know, and it was, you know, never, we never used We never used those bands because it was less expensive. Um, It was really about what what fit. Um, And music was really exciting in in those years. In this video, I will be ranking my top 10 personal favorite needle drops on the OC. Now, I'm also aware that this soundtrack is something that a lot of people have very strong feelings about. So if I do not pick your personal faves, please do not take it personally. And just an obligatory disclaimer, as always, this video contains heavy spoilers, so do not watch further if you do not want the show ruined for you. And without further ado, let's get into it. Spoons, The Way We Get By soundtracks the cold open of season one, episode five. The song plays during a montage of Seth and Ryan playfully gallivanting through Newport. Ryan on his bike and Seth on his skateboard as they maneuver through a sea of tourists and beachgoers on their way to the Crab Shack, where Ryan would later get his first job. That's the way we get by, the way we get by. The song is bouncy and easygoing, making it perfect for very simple acts of play and teenage boy mischief that Ryan and Seth get up to. But in the context of everything that's come before, it's such a heartwarming display. Ryan finally has a real friend and confidant whom he has permission to be silly around, and that makes for one of the most unforgettable and poignant turning points in the entire show. What I loved about the character Marissa Cooper is how she offers a peek into the dark underbelly of the poor little rich girl trope. As the daughter of a wealthy financial advisor and socialite mother, Marissa seems to have everything going for her. She's the queen bee with a heart of gold who represents the town's picture-perfect ideal. But underneath the shiny surface was a deeply flawed and troubled teenager who never sought out the help she needed, sinking deeper into quicksand with her substance abuse, codependency, and reckless behavior until it eventually killed her. Marissa paid plenty of visits to death's door prior to her murder in the season 3 finale. In the seventh episode of the first season, she is found unconscious in an alley in Tijuana after overdosing on painkillers. As Ryan carries her body to safety, Into Dust by Mazzy Starr plays. What I love so much about this scene and the song choice is the juxtaposition of chaos and silence. The situation Marissa has dragged her friends into is a major scare and a premonition for the way she would only descend further into her reckless spiral, sucking everybody she knew and loved into her vortex of drama. Marissa never stood a chance. She was already fading away from the very beginning. The lyrics of the song certainly foreshadow as much. I could feel my eyes turning into dust. Okay, I have another confession. Season 2, episode 15, otherwise known as The Mall Episode, is one of my favorite episodes of the OC. It wasn't received very well when it aired, but overall, I thought it was an incredibly fun and light come down from the dramatic turn of events prior. In the previous episode, Lindsay had moved to Chicago and left Ryan in shambles. 
This was a lighter episode that allowed him to reconnect with his friends and remember what he's doing here to begin with. And it was so nice to see the core four just be silly for a change. This episode is also lovingly referred to by fans as the beck episode, since it ended up being an episode of the show where Beck premiered some of his new material at the time, including EPRO, which plays as Ryan, Marissa, Seth, and Summer play indoor hockey. It's a memorable sequence with an equally memorable soundtrack, and I have absolutely nothing to complain about. And to this day, I still cannot hear that crunchy ass riff without hearing Summer Roberts scream. What? One incredibly effective technique that the OC mastered better than any other televised drama of its time is utilizing a single track as an effective narrative device for a single episode. Keep this in mind when we get to the top of the list because it will return. We Used to Be Friends by Bohemian Early Aughts Art Rockers The Dandy Warhols introduces the opening sequence of Season 1, Episode 12, The Secret. Seth Cohen opens the episode gallivanting around the halls of his family's mansion while the song plays in the background. And by the way, I've never been more sure of anything in my life. Emerald Fennel absolutely had this specific scene on a loop when she wrote The End of Saltburn. It's a matter on the dance floor. The minute the mood changes is when the song comes to a halt and Seth's demeanor changes completely, walking into his home kitchen feigning a cough and pretending to be sick so he wouldn't have to go to school that day and face Summer and Anna, two girls who he totally led on as they battled for his affection. The second time we hear the opening record scratch of We Used To Be Friends, we see Summer and Anna in the bathroom conspiring to band together to take down Seth as he is now a common enemy. So how much bacteria? Like a lot? A lot. Thanks. The genius of centering an episode around a single song is the way the song will act as a form of tension and release, serving as a through line and driving every shift in the plot line. I was hoping I'd bump into you. I wanted to hi, Summer. And Anna hanging out together. Wow. So, hey. Big test. You know what? Don't. And if you're also wondering where you might have heard this song before, then you might also remember it as the main theme for Veronica Mars. Maybe I'm amazed at the way you help me sing my song. A fellow writer and pen pal of mine is a massive Beatles fan. They saw Paul McCartney live, and they were 100% certain that Hey Jude would be the song to make them cry. Surprisingly, it actually ended up being Band on the Run that got them. The takeaway from this being that they might actually be a bigger Wings fan than Beatles fan. I know that's a controversial take, but I also don't believe that Paul McCartney deserves half as much of the flack he gets. Are some of his creative choices a little silly? Sure, but what artist doesn't have those moments? I think a large part of this stems from wanting to see a giant fall, and the schadenfreude that the audience feels when a major artist eventually does flop and embarrass themselves. I say all this to say, all of his shortcomings aside, Paul McCartney still remains one of the greatest songwriters who ever lived. One of my favorite McCartney songs of all time is Maybe I'm Amazed. The OC flipped the song to a female perspective in the show by having Welsh soft electronica songwriter Jem perform Maybe I'm Amazed in the season one finale at Caleb and Julie's wedding before Ryan leaves Orange County to return to his hometown, Chino. Him and Marissa dance at the wedding while the song is performed, and the lyrics are the perfect mirror to how Marissa is clearly feeling in this episode. Maybe I'm amazed at the way you're with me all the time Maybe I'm afraid of the way 
And what makes this scene extra painful to watch after having seen the whole show is knowing that it's only downhill from here, bookending the finale of the only season where Ryan and Marissa were ever truly happy together. Okay, so it's very rare that I have ever seen a temporary guest star pop onto the OC who I wasn't relieved to see make their exit. For all the hate that Oliver gets for being a narcissistic sociopath, at least he generated traffic by pissing off the audience and making them want to tear their hair out. That's what you want in a soap opera. The others, like Lindsay, for instance, she was just a bland stand-in for Marissa in her absence from Ryan's life, and I didn't miss her when she left. And Johnny, for lack of a more eloquent descriptor, sucked. There are only two temporary guest stars whose characters I would make an exception for. One of them is Michael Cassidy's character, Zach. I really enjoyed Zack's dynamic with Seth and the fact that he was allowed to be a multi-dimensional human who was both a massive water polo playing jock and a massive nerd, who loved superhero comics as much as Seth did. But my ultimate favorite side character, who deserved so much more airtime, was Olivia Wilde's character Alex Kelly. Alex was the sharp-tongued, no-nonsense high school dropout who ran the ship at the bait shop, the local music venue and Orange County nightclub hotspot, where most of the guest performers like Death Cab and the Killers would make their appearances. A major part of Alex's character that the writers didn't shy away from, which was major for the early aughts, was the fact that Alex is bisexual. In season two, Alex and Marissa get swept up into a whirlwind, albeit brief, romance, even moving in together for a short time. And since the OC was a little before my time and I didn't really catch on to the obsession with the show until much later, which was after I came out, I totally see looking back now how special this relationship was for queer women at the time, especially in the 2000s. In season two, episode 10, The Accomplice, Alex and Marissa bond over their tumultuous relationships with their parents in Alex's car. Portions for Foxes by Rilo Kiley plays on Alex's car stereo, the lyrics serving as an act of foreshadowing for the way their relationship would eventually collapse. Well, wish I could do that. Piss your parents off bad enough. Believe me, I've tried. Well, then I guess they really love you. Do you ever miss yours? Sometimes. But my friends are my family, you know? Mm-hmm. I know. It's clear that these two are in the early stages of falling for each other, and the melody of the song is like crack. And what better way is there to soundtrack sapphic yearning than with the belting dulcet tones of Jenny Diane Lewis? Perfect. 10 out of 10. No notes. So, John Hughes. Let's talk about the guy. He's a directorial legend, albeit a somewhat controversial one. But regardless of whether or not you believe Hughes' writing has aged well, there's no denying that he coveted and dominated the coming-of-age genre in the 80s and 90s with titles like Ferris Bueller's Day Off, The Breakfast Club, Pretty in Pink, Sixteen Candles, Home Alone, I mean, come on. He was a remarkable storyteller whose coming-of-age films masterfully captured the angsty essence of being a teenager in the way very few directors were able to grasp at the time. And my god, the music! Can we talk about the music in these movies? It's evident that so much care was put into the soundtracks of Hughes' films because they evoke such an emotional response in the audience and the characters. To quote Hughes' music supervisor Tarkin Goch, John was looking for emotion. He wanted music to tell the teenagers what they were feeling. And he got it right. He made the music pop and he made the scenes better. My personal favorite John Hughes needle drop is If You Leave by 80s new wave synth pop duo Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. It soundtracks the end of Pretty in Pink. In the OC, 
A more slow and somber cover of If You Leave by Not A Surf is played at the end of season one in the episode The Goodbye Girl, in the final scene where Anna, one of Seth Cohen's best friends and former girlfriend, is about to leave town permanently, and Seth chases her through the airport to say his final goodbye. It's such an emotional scene because even with all the romantic implications aside, we witness Seth's heartbreak over having to say goodbye to one of his only real friends, aside from Ryan, Marissa, and Summer. The song choice feels especially apt and definitely not a coincidence that it also happened to be in a John Hughes film, because Alexandra Patsavas has openly admitted that she wanted to emulate the John Hughes effect with the way music was put to use in the OC. I was from Chicago and was a huge John Hughes fan. I feel like there's some very Hughesian moments in the OC. If you think about that not a surf scene, um, super Hughesian, right? Like, I, you know, su super John Hughesian, like just the way mm -hmm. um, it takes over for dialogue. In Pretty in Pink, when the original song plays, the scene is a romantic reconciliation between Molly Ringwald's Andy and her love interest Blaine, portrayed by Andrew McCarthy, at their senior prom. The bombastic production and shimmering synths give an extra oomph to this triumphant union of the two romantic leads. The reason why the more slow, stripped-back cover by Not A Surf was so perfect for the OC is because it's soundtracking a goodbye. The tone of the cover is sorrowful, running parallel to the way Anna's departure feels to Seth and viewers. Every little minute detail was taken into consideration when soundtracking the entire show, and this scene is a perfect distillation of that. Oh, wait a second. What am I gonna do without you? What am I gonna play Jenga with? You're so wise and all your sage wisdom. What am I gonna do without that? Confidence, Do not insult Death Cab. It's like one guitar and a whole lot of complaining. All right, I know you've all been waiting for this one, so here you go, you hungry suckers. The infamous Do Not Insult Death Cab track. Seth Cohen is known for his many quirks, chief among them being his love of Death Cab for Cutie. Death Cab is just as important of a major character as any human creation on the OC. Since they are Seth Cohen's favorite band, this iconic roadside argument in season one is far from the only time they're mentioned in the show. At every Chrismica, Seth always puts a song by Death Cab in his personal starter pack mix. In season two, episode 22, Death Cab perform at the bait shop, and it's a tense environment because Summer is there alone without Seth, who ended up having to miss the show due to business obligations with the comic book he's developing. In 2013, Jessica Hopper wrote a great article in BuzzFeed titled How Selling Out Saved Indie Rock. Her thesis in this essay is the fact that the major structural changes in the music industry post-Napster had largely left independent artists astray, leaving them with little to no lucrative options for pursuing music full-time because nobody was getting paid. One of the people Hopper interviews in this article is Gabe McDonough, the then vice president of advertising company Leo Burnett Worldwide. McDonough handled music supervision on a majority of their advertising campaigns, and what he said at the end of the essay really stuck with me. These big companies are the last people paying musicians what they are worth. And it wasn't just commercials that provided these big breakthrough opportunities for artists. Another way for them to get their name out there was sync licensing which is when a song's copyright holder grants permission for their song to be used in various forms of media, usually television shows and films. These placements helped artists like Death Cab, who already had cult followings, reach new heights. Where we really noticed it was when we were, be when we were in Europe, because at that point, we were doing pretty well for ourselves in, in the States, and our records were selling okay. But over in Europe, a lot of our records were not available. They were only available on import. So we didn't have a record label in on mainland Europe until Transatlanticism came out in 2003. All the other records were 
you know, they weren't as readily available. So when we started touring in Europe off of transatlanticism, uh, we got a lot of questions about the OC and it was really confusing to us at the time. But then we realized, oh, the show beat us <laughs> over here. It's like oh. people were watching the show in Europe and they were hearing about this band and the overwhelming majority of people, it's, it felt at that point, were getting to Death Cab via the OC rather than us having had established ourselves over there. And then the show gave us a boost, if that makes sense. What you say. Okay, so before I go any further, I'm gonna just get this out of the way. I know, it's a meme, someone gets shot, what you say, so funny, the peak of comedy, LOL. What you say, what you say, what you say. But you know what my problem is with memes? Context gets lost. And within the context of this episode, there was no other option. This was the only song choice that would have had this type of impact. And you can see why when you watch the episode. I heard, or I read, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you'd have this song, but you didn't quite know where it was going to go. Is that true? That is true. Um, okay. uh, we were given the entire album early. So we had, um, we had Imogen's album. Um, that album was just, you know, it's just gorgeous. And in retrospect, we all know it, but like, it was just beautiful and interesting. Um, and Josh wanted to hold on to hide and seek because he knew there, he knew that there was going to be a place for it that was impactful. Remember how much I loved the consistent use of We Used to Be Friends by the Dandy Warhols in the season one episode, The Secret? Well, this is the episode where that repeated use of a single song reaches its pinnacle in the OC. The song starts after we first see Jess give Trey a gun, the same gun that Marissa would later use to shoot him to save Ryan. The song soundtracks everybody's arrival at Caleb's funeral. Caleb Nickel was not a man of many words. He was, however, a brilliant man. He leaves a legacy of possibility, but his true achievement were his children. He was a caring father, a wonderful grandfather, a truly terrible father-in-law. So I walked through the valley of the So, he may be gone, but he won't soon be forgotten. Rest in peace, Cal. And if you can't do that, I'm sure heaven could use a few more McMansions. It's somber, and it's a slow build up to an eventual climax, where Ryan would later confront his brother Trey after finding out that Trey tried to force himself on Marissa. Marissa eventually shows up to intervene and shoots Trey with the same gun that Trey was given when we first hear the song. Chekhov's what you say, if you will. Shopping for girlfriends in the quad? Yeah. No. <laughs> Classy. And it's gonna be hard to top this one, so you're probably left wondering what could possibly be number one. Well, surprise, surprise, it also involves Imogen Heap. I used to live alone before I knew you. Marissa. I cannot stress enough how much of a culture shock the death of Marissa Cooper was to viewers at the time when the season three finale aired. I'm talking there were girls who couldn't go to school the next day. While Marissa's death was incredibly controversial and had upset many people, it only felt like a natural conclusion to her story to me. The series had foreshadowed this moment again and again, bringing her closer to death's door with every episode. How much longer could Ryan keep coming to her rescue 
until she eventually dragged him down with her. But it was so, it was important to see Ryan heal from this very tragic love story. You want to call it like a Romeo and Juliet thing, but that's not even a romance. Romeo and Juliet is a tragedy. And I think Ryan and Marissa were a tragedy, unfortunately. I will admit, watching Ben McKenzie Jesus carrying Misha Barton away from the car wreckage in flames to an acapella cover of Hallelujah may look and sound ridiculous out of context. But in the vein of the story as a whole and knowing Ryan and Marissa's history, it's just brilliant. Is it a little over the top and soap opera-esque? Of course, but that's kind of the point. It wouldn't be a Josh Schwartz teen drama without the epic, over-the-top, ridiculous, melodramatic cinematography. What makes this song choice in particular hit so hard is the fact that it's not the first time we hear Hallelujah in the context of Ryan and Marissa's story. In the very beginning of season one, while Seth and Marissa help Ryan hide out in Kirsten's model home so he wouldn't get taken back into police custody and sent to social services, Marissa makes Ryan a mix CD. And in episode two, when Marissa visits Ryan on what they believe will be their last night together, the Jeff Buckley cover of Hallelujah plays, and Marissa utters rather flirtatiously, This song reminds me of you. Hallelujah was there when Ryan and Marissa's story began, and it came back around to soundtrack their tragic end. Pretty poetic, if you ask me. Thank you for listening to me ramble on about the OC soundtrack. I guess maybe I say all this to say the OC is good, actually. That's not exactly the point of this video, since my wheelhouse is more of the music. But if you want a good convincing case on why the OC is so great, then I recommend watching Patrick Willem's excellent video essay on the show. I really wanted to put a spotlight specifically on all the amazing work of music supervisor Alexandra Patsavas, as the people in her type of position are rarely ever named and given recognition unless you look for them. So I guess the point of this video is to say, appreciate your music supervisors, name your supervisors. They are the tone setters for your favorite shows. Without them, you have no show at all. So appreciate them. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video, whenever that may be. Thanks for sticking around. Love y'all.